All right, all right, all right. So we're going to play a little uh, Name That Hymn Tune this morning. Y'all up for that? I know, this is a contemporary service. We don't sing, yes, we do sing hymns, just not as much as in the first service. And I know, I know, some of you are not all that knowledgeable on hymn tune names. Some of you um, are, but some of you maybe not so. Um, so just to make it fair, we're going to disqualify Kathy Culver from competing, okay? <laughs> just saying, all right? So she, she can't compete. Uh, that would be totally unfair. Now, there will be four hymns that you need to name that tune to. All right, I'll play a little bit of it in just a moment. And just a heads up, tech team, I'm going to go use the keyboard to do that, all right? So, uh, and, and I have a fabulous prize for you, okay, again today. Um, now, no, it's not coffee in the lobby. I wouldn't do that twice, at least in one in, in, in a row. Um, no, I have a basket full of Reese's and Kit Kats and... M&M's, you can take your pick for a prize, okay? You win, you come on up after the service, after the service, and help yourself to a prize. You earned it. All right, so now here's the deal. Here's how it works. Um, I'll play a little of the tune. When you figure out the tune, you raise your hand. Don't blurt it out. You're disqualified. You blurt it out. You'll ruin it, okay? Don't do that. You wait, wait for your, raise, raise your hand. I'll call on you, and um, there we go. You say, you are so weird. What is your problem? All right. Name that hymn tune, church family, and have a little fun in church today. So, all right, let me get my hymns out here. They are in here. Here we go, here we go. All right. Let's see. All right. That'll work. All right, name this hymn tune. Anybody have it? Oh, seriously? Oh, seriously, you got to raise your hand. I'll play a little more. Ah. All right, Dan Keefe, Pastor Dan Keefe. So, so I'll give you a hint. The, the first word of the song is the title. Okay, anybody have it? All right, I'm, I'm not going to give it away easily. Yes, go ahead. Redeemed. Redeemed, absolutely. Thank you, Diane. You got the, give her a round of applause. That was hard earned, <laughs> right? All right, now listen, if you don't get this one, I'm just saying, we're going to have to rock some hymns more often in this service, uh, including Pastor Ben. He, he, he ought to get this one. This is in my top 10 hymns, okay? This one here, it, it, don't let me down here. So I'm, I'm looking for a hand. Here we go. I can play. Dave Childs. Oh, uh, no. No? I see that hand. Yes, Paul. To God be the glory. Give him a round of applause. He got it right. Absolutely. I, I maybe should have disqualified the Osbournes, too. I'm just saying, but that's right. All right, now, listen, this one's a tough one. I'll admit, the first service crew, even, crowd even had a little bit of trouble here, but I know you can get it. All right, here we go. Is it coming to anybody? No, no, no. I'll, I'll, I'll jump to the refrain. This is where the title is. First word in the refrain. First, three words. I see that hand. Yes, Pastor Dan. Close to thee. Close to thee. Absolutely. That's it. Close to thee. Okay. All right. I know. I know. You don't, you don't think you should have to work this hard coming to church. I, I get it. But listen, this is, this, is, this is tough stuff. All right. Easy one here. I mean, even Pastor Ben can get this one. All right, here we go. <laughs> oh, I see that hand. Let's see. Who, who, who's back there? Libby, I think I saw your hand first. Blessed Assurance. All right, give her a round of applause. <laughs> all right, all right. Don't forget to get your, your prizes up. Now, oh, we have a bonus round. Bonus round. Um, who can tell me? 
who authored all four of those hymns? Ah, we got a hand. All right, I, I'm good. I, so, Pastor Dan, you won once. I, I'm going to call on Mrs. Eppiheimer. Joan, Fanny Crosby. Some of you recognize that name. Some of you don't. Who's the world is Fanny Crosby? Well, here's the deal. In honor of Women's History Month, month of March, uh, and what would have been her 203rd birthday two days ago, let me tell you a little bit about hymn writer Fanny Crosby. So there was a guy back in the middle 1800s, uh, also wrote a lot of hymns. We sing some of them. They're in our hymnal. Excellent hymn writer named William Bradbury. He had a publisher, publishing house of Christian music. And he wasn't very happy with the submissions. The music was coming in. It was kind of lame, theologically thin, and just, just, just not good music. You sound familiar? A lot of these same songs sung in every, sung in every generation. Well, he received a submission from this woman named Fanny Crosby, and after verifying her talent and her heart for the Lord, he hired her, and he told her, listen, as long as I have a publishing house, you are going to have a job. And Fanny Crosby went on to write more than nine thousand hymns. No kidding. Many of them are still in our hymnal today. As I said, one of those is like in my top ten favorites. Um, we sing a lot of those hymns in the first service. We sometimes I sing them in this service as well. Uh, did, I mention, did I mention that Fanny Crosby was totally blind from birth? Did I, did I mention that to you? Now, um, you know, I'll tell you what, being blind today is a tough, tough deal. Uh, Back in the 1800s, mid-1800s, I mean, Braille had just been invented, and a, a woman, um, blind woman, I mean, the opportunities for her were extremely limited. There were no voting rights, you understand, ladies, back then, for, for women. Uh, you couldn't own property. Women could not own property. They couldn't even uh, keep their own wages, right? Imagine, imagine the seeming... Uh, you know, this mountain of odds, immense odds that were stacked against Fanny Crosby as a, a blind girl born in 1820. What kind of future do you realistically think there would be for a girl like that? And how could it be that someone like her could to realize such incredible success so that 200 years later, we're still talking about her songs. We're still singing. By the way, her music has sold over 100 million copies. That's, that's pretty good success. Well, here, here, here it is. Here, I think the answer to her success, her, her secret formula, she said, was this. Before she sat down to write every hymn, she prayed, and she asked Jesus to be her inspiration. There it is. That's, that's exactly what she said. And so that led to one hymn one day that it was a home run, to the next day, another home run hymn, to the next day, to the next day, to the next day, and, and can we say that those investments of her talent and, and, and time and prayer and all the rest are still paying dividends 200 years later? So in Fanny Crosby's honor, I've titled today's message, How Today Determines Your Tomorrow. See, some of us may feel like the deck is stacked against us. You may be wondering if what you're doing today makes any significance in the vast scheme of things. Oh, you, you know, you, you go through the motions, but you wonder sometimes, is what I'm doing in service to the Lord, is, is he pleased with that service? Some of us may feel like we're a failure because we're struggling at work. Some of us may look at our kids and we think we're failures. Others of us look at our finances and we feel like failures. Some, some of us notice the repeated patterns that just seem to come come up in our lives over and over again of attitudes and, and stuff that comes out of our mouth, our language and our actions. And we wonder if God doesn't just look at us and see a, just a colossal failure. Well, if you identify with any of those things, this message is for you today. This message is for you. We're going to see how what you do today determines your tomorrow. So if you aren't already open there, join me, please, at Luke chapter 19. Let's go get a copy of God's Word open. There's an outline in your bulletin. Those of you online, again, good to have you with us. We are one family, whether we're here or, or there, wherever there is for you. Uh, you can download a copy, as uh, Pastor John said, uh, today's bulletin with the outline at our website. So this is week 11 in our Jesus Stories with Luke series. Recent weeks we've been following Luke as he's been detailing Jesus', Jesus final journey to Jerusalem for the celebration feast of Passover. He knows that he, there he will be tried, he will be convicted, he will be crucified, he will be buried. But then, three days later, he will be miraculously and triumphantly raised to life. The event of events, right? This is what we're going to celebrate two weeks from today. It's going to be awesome. 
All right, well, a little bit of background before we dive in. Jesus is making his way from the north up in the Galilee region, northern part of Israel, uh, southward to Jerusalem. He's almost to the town of Jericho. And some of you went to Jericho. Well, last time we went to Israel, we went to Jericho, and we ate at this really cool pizza place. I didn't know their pizza place. Remember Earhart and Kathy? It was pretty good pizza, you know? I didn't know they had the pizza. So, and that was the place, by the way, some of you know another Fanny that's part of our church. She may be online with us. A lot of times she's on the first service. And do you remember she was... She was um, Flirting with those two Israeli officers, remember? I have the pictures to prove it. If you, want, you, don't, you don't believe me, listen. So, Fanny, we um, we'll just have to rib on you just a little bit. It was a lot of fun. So, um, Jesus is coming almost to, to Jerusalem, or excuse me, almost to Jericho. And along the way, he's been encountering, as he's been making his way towards Jerusalem, sick people and um, diseased people and disabled people and everyone needing his healing touch. In fact, at the end of chapter 18, Jesus heals a blind person, a blind man, with just his word. So crowds of people are following and traveling along with Jesus now on their pilgrimage to Jerusalem, and he's making his way from Jericho to Jerusalem, as I said, for the festival of Passover. Passover. Um, so I want to show you a picture of what the road uh, Jesus and crowds of others would have traveled on up to Jerusalem. This is present day, okay? This is what the road looks like uh, today. It's a pretty desolate place out there in the Judean wilderness. In fact, Jericho is 720 feet below sea level. It's one of the lowest places on the planet you can visit. I mean, you probably go to the bottom of the ocean if you had the right gear, but you know what I'm saying. So uh, from there, though, to travel to Israel or to Jerusalem, you, you go up 3,200 feet to the city of Jerusalem. It's, it's quite, a, quite a journey. All right, so as we get into chapter 19, we're going to move fairly quickly through these first 10 verses that Pastor Steve read earlier because we, we've dealt with the account of Zacchaeus in the past. This text collector has this amazing, um, literally come to Jesus moment, and we've dealt with that in other times past. Uh, the focus of our time today is going to be this potent parable that Jesus shares in the middle of chapter 19. But first things first, it's important. Let's start at verse 1. And um, Jesus enters Jericho, Luke says, and he was, and was passing through. And a man there by the name of Zacchaeus was a chief tax collector. And this, this guy was loaded. You know, anything about, remember anything about Zacchaeus, you need to remember that he was loaded. The way the Roman government had set up it was uh, to collect their taxes was they employed Jews to basically extort money out of their fellow Jews. And they could charge whatever they want, and he did. He way overcharged um, his fellow Jews and made himself filthy rich. And then there's this funny scene, right, that because he's short, he has to climb a tree. By the way, can we still say short, or does that have to be height challenge? I'm just, I'm just curious. I'm just, we can, okay, the Bible says short, so I'm going to use short. Um, so he gets up in the tree, and he does, does more than see Jesus, right? Jesus calls to him and, and says, hey, hey, Zacchaeus, come on down. I'm going to your house for dinner. I mean, how cool would that be? How, that, how wonderful that would be to let the Lord say, I'm coming to your house tonight. And, of course, this sends the religious rule keepers into orbit because it was totally taboo to be eating with well-known sinners like Zacchaeus. I mean, he, they were considered lowlifes. I mean, basically, to eat with them would be endorsing their behavior. Why would he do that? But Zacchaeus is totally taken with Jesus, not just because of his miracle-working power physically, but his miracle-working power emotionally, mentally, spiritually, within and, and, and so he repents of his past, and he tells everybody, anybody that I have cheated, I will pay you back four times what I charged you. And so Jesus concludes today, salvation has come to this house. And then he explains, explains that the, man, the Son of Man came to seek and to save those who were lost. And that's exactly what's been happening. Many lost people have been finding a restored relationship with God through Jesus. The prideful, self-righteous, rule-keeping crowd didn't know they needed a Savior, but people like Zacchaeus, they knew full well that they were missing the mark and they needed a rescue. All right, so now we come to verse 11. While they were listening to this, Jesus went on to tell them a parable. Here we go. 
because he was near Jerusalem, and the people thought that the kingdom of God was going to appear at once. Okay, so what follows is this powerful parable of the ten servants, and I want to give you a little bit of context. Now, some people reading this uh, mistakenly think that this is the same parable that Matthew records over in his gospel, chapter 25. It's not. That parable is sim uh, similar, but Jesus uh, tells that similar parable um, to, privately to his disciples. Here he's obviously speaking to a crowd. So similar but not the same. Now notice that Luke says that Jesus tells this parable because expectations are rising that Jesus is going to enter Jerusalem. He's going to make a big announcement that he is beginning his kingdom reign. He's going to establish his kingdom. And we know that the Romans weren't the only ones that were wary of Jesus. The Jewish big shots had been planning for months how they were going to get rid of him. Um, and that was, <laughs> if nothing else, right, it was because he'd been exposing them pretty regularly for the bigoted, hypocritical frauds that they were. And he was repeatedly poking them in the eye, right, calling them fools, blind guides, hypocrites. But Jesus had also been clear for those who had been paying attention that his kingdom was not of this world, and at least not yet. In fact, he's been repeatedly working to prepare his disciples for his departure. His kingdom would come one day to earth fully, completely. He would rule and reign over all peoples of the earth, but not right away. No, there would be a gap between the launching of his kingdom and the full realization of his reign. And that gap, we understand now, has been 2,000 years and counting. So Jesus' purpose in telling the parable is to set their expectations right, to get them prepared for what is coming, what's ahead. And let's just cover the, the cast of characters in the, the parable, too. It's pretty simple. There's a very wealthy man. There are 10 servants. And then there's a crowd of haters. People who are jealous, spiteful, dead sent against the wealthy man ruling so that's, that's it, okay? All right, so Jesus is going to tell this parable in three scenes. We'll take them one at a time, and he begins the first scene in verse 12. He said, a noble man, or a man of noble birth, went to a distant country to have himself appointed king and then to return. So he called his ten servants and gave them ten minas. Put, these money, put this money to work, he said, until I come back. But his subjects hated him and sent a delegation after him to say, well, we don't want this man to be our king. All right, so here it is. This is scene one. A rich man is preparing to leave for a distant land. He's wealthy. Um, so Jesus says he's of noble birth. He's, he's loaded. And he says he's preparing for a long journey to a distant country, and he's going to be gone a while. So the purpose of his trip, is, is to be crowned king. And that, that sounds a little weird to us. Why, why would you go to that country to be, go far away to be crowned king? A lot, of, a lot of us would have trouble even identifying with that in any way. But let me tell you what, people back then would have gotten it like in an instant. They would have made an instant connection. Let me tell you why. Y'all remember Herod the Great? Obviously, you don't remember him. You don't remember him, right? You know, you, you've heard about him. But um, we, we talked about Herod the Great lots. Uh, Rome appointed client king over the land of Judea that he called the Herodian kingdom. And Herod was an unbelievable builder of colossal structures, some that exist to this day. Uh, parts of the, the, the temple, in other words, exist to this day. But he built the temple that in Jesus' day they were worshiping at. He also built this grandiose port at Caesarea. It's just spectacular. The ruins exist today. He also built castle fortresses like Masada. When we go to Israel, we always go to Masada. It sits high above the desert. You can't figure out how in the world could he ever build it up. He, he built a grandiose projects like that. But when he died, Herod gave his, uh, three of his sons rulership of his kingdom. There was Herod Antipas, which, who was a real loser and a tyrant, up north around the Sea of Galilee. He's the guy that had John the Baptist beheaded. Further north yet, there was Herod Philip. Can you tell they're into Herod? <laughs> Herod this, Herod, Herod Antipas, Herod Philip, and then down around Judea, the area around Jerusalem, we had um, Herod Archelaus. And he gave his kingdom to his three sons, but they all had to go to Rome to sort of kiss the king, 
uh, king's ring, right? And uh, be officially crowned king so that they could reign. So you get, see how Jesus is weaving in this history, okay, into his parable. And parable has a, has a significant spiritual meaning to it. So while the rich guy is going to be gone, he entrusts his wealth to his ten servants. Luke says he gives, um, the, uh, Jesus says that he gives each one of the servants ten or it gives them each a mina, okay? Each servant, each of the ten gets a mina. And if you have a footnote like my Bible does, uh, it will tell you that that was equivalent to three months' wages. That's a pretty big deal. That's a pretty big sum of money. And he tells them to put it to work, to invest it wisely, wisely to earn him more while he's going to be away. And notice verse 14, Jesus adds to his parable that the, the rich man's subjects, not the servants, but the subjects hated him and sent a delegation to the, far, to the faraway country to oppose him and tell leaders there, we don't want this man to be our king. And that was also true of Herod Archelaus. <laughs> History tells us that the people of Judea sent a delegation of 50 guys to Rome to tell Caesar Augustus, we don't want this man to reign over us, we hate him. No. But Caesar Augustus gave Archelaus the kingdom anyway. So See what, how Jesus is pulling something? I mean, they would have made instant connection to this, this parable that he's weaving now into some profound uh, implications for us. Um, so that's scene one. All right, scene two now opens in verse 15. It says, he was made king, however, and returned home. Okay, so that's scene two, the, the rich man returning now. Let's continue. Then he sent for the servants to whom he had given the money in order to find out what they had gained with it. The first one came and said, Sir, your mina has earned ten more. Well done, my good servant, his master replied, because you have been trustworthy in a very small matter. Take charge of ten cities. And the second came and said, Sir, your mina has earned five more. His master answered, You take charge of five cities. Then another servant came and said, Sir, here's your mina. I kept it laid away in a piece of cloth. I was afraid of you because you are a hard man. You take out what you did not put in, and you reap what you did not sow. His master replied, I'll judge you by your own words, you wicked servant. You knew, did you, that I am a hard man taking out what I did not put in and reaping what I did not sow? Then why didn't you put my money on deposit so that when I came back, I could have collected it with interest? Then he said to those standing by, take his mina away and give it to him, Give it to the one who has ten minas. Sir, they said, he already has ten. And he replied, I tell you, to, uh, tell you that to everyone who has, more will be given. But for, as for the one who has nothing, even what he has will be taken away. Now again, remember, each of these ten servants was entrusted with the same amount of money. Each received a mina. Each received three months' wages. They could do anything they wanted to with that money. They could invest it to yield the greatest return on investment that, that they could imagine. It was up to them. Two of the servants invest wisely, and they yield incredible, awesome returns. One guy, I mean, a thousand percent return on his investment. That's, that's the guy I want to have or my investment advisor, right? Then you got another guy that does, that does a 500 percent return. And for their wide stewardship, what they've been given, they are given an incredible reward. Responsibilities over ten cities, over five cities. But there's a third servant, and the guy does nothing. And because of that, he loses everything. Instead of taking prudent, wise risks, putting what he'd been given to work for his master, he does nothing. He doesn't even put it on deposit so that at least there'll be some modicum of interest when the master returns. No, he wraps it up, takes what he's been given, sets it aside, and basically forgets about it. And then he has the audacity to tell the rich master that he knew his expectations were, were way too high and, and, you know, he just couldn't be bothered. Just couldn't be bothered. So he held on to what he'd been given at the beginning. All right, now we get into the conclusion and the summary of this. So it's scene three now with the rich man's response. Again, he given every one of his servants the same opportunity. They all got a mina, three months' wages, same instructions, put it 
to work while I'm away. Two of the servants work very hard, they make a great return, and they receive even, an even greater bonus, right? Great honors when the master returns. However, the lazy servant loses everything because he did nothing. He did nothing. And then, verse 27, the master says, but those enemies of mine who did not want me to be king over them, bring them here and kill them in front of me. The rich man's enemies were killed. They had plotted, they had opposed him, they had tried to prevent him from ruling, and in the end, they were judged and killed. And that, brothers and sisters, is the end of Jesus' parable of the ten servants. And it brings us to our momentous moment of the morning. Yep, we get to ask our most important question. Let's hear it on three. One, two, three. So what? Jesus had a knack for parables. We get that. But Pastor Marmon, what in the world does this have to do with us? I mean, these, these parables were, were taught 2,000 years ago. How could this possibly have anything for us? I mean, for our lives. I mean, this is the last Sunday in in 2023, isn't, isn't this just another example of a Bible story that's kind of fun to listen to, but doesn't really have any application to us? If you're thinking that, let me challenge that thought. This parable has tremendous application and implications for you and for me. So we're going to take just a few moments to unpack this carefully and carefully together about the parable's meaning for us today. See, Jesus didn't tell stories. You understand, Jesus didn't tell stories, didn't par tell parables to, to amuse people, to entertain them. And this isn't like some bedtime story, right? No, he, he said it had application to his disciples and to the crowd that was gathered that, that day in Jericho. And hear me, it has application for us. His disciples and the crowd that's gathered today or online, wherever you happen to be. You see, like the rich man who left to be crowned king, and then return. G king Jesus, too, has left, but will soon be returning. The Father in heaven has already seated King Jesus at the right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every title that can be given, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come, Ephesians. Let there be no doubt, just as the crowd of people who stood on the Mount of Olives and saw as Jesus rose before their eyes and ascended into heaven and then heard angels say, why do you stare gazing into the sky? This same Jesus you saw seen go into heaven is coming down in the same way you've seen him come or go. Right? Every eye, Scripture says, will see him. Yes, there's been 2,000 years, but don't think he's not returning. Jesus is coming again. Until then, each one of us who is his disciple has been entrusted with a treasure. We've been entrusted with the gospel. We all get the same treasure. Every single one of us gets the same treasure. You don't get any more than I do. I don't get any more than you do. Each one of us has been given the greatest news of all, that Jesus came to die for our sins, that he rose again in victory, and we can have hope in this life and for eternity if we will but put our faith in him and live his way. That's the gospel. You've been entrusted with that message just as I have. Jesus has sent us and told us to spread the word, to invest it wisely, to make disciples of all nations to put it to work of transforming and saving people for eternity. And rich rewards await those of us who invest the gospel wisely in the lives of others. So us are, we're part of that really creative thing yesterday we called Easter Jam, right? Find a creative way to invest again more of the gospel in the lives of young children and their parents. Some who don't attend this church aren't a part of any church. And we work, work, we work together, we link arms with missionaries and people all over to share the gospel with those who have yet to hear and understand and believe it for themselves. Now, your gifts, your abilities, your experiences, your opportunities may be different than mine. Some of you will realize greater returns for your efforts. But just like the servant who earned five times got the same commendation 
as the servant who earned 10, right? Everybody who seriously invests in the kingdom, invests the gospel, will be richly rewarded. That's what Jesus is saying. However, failure to, obey, to invest what has been entrusted to us is evidence, at the very least, of laziness. It will not be rewarded. In fact, it will mean a loss of reward. There are many today who do not take seriously the call of the master to invest what has been entrusted to them until he returns. They think the gospel's for them. They think it's, it's like some little fire insurance policy, right, that they wrap up and they tuck away someplace. And when the moment gets right and they're about to cross over from this world into the next, they just pre present their ticket. But until then, they've got better things to do. They can't be bothered with investing in the kingdom. I was reading this week about the Apostle Paul, what he said in his first letter to the believers at Corinth. Chapter 3, he says that the quality of everyone's work will be shown for exactly what it is. Paul says that our work of investing in the gospel, here's his words, will be revealed with fire. And the fire will test the quality of every person's work. If what he has built survives, he will receive his reward. But if it is burned up, he will suffer loss. He himself will be saved but only as one escaping through flames. In other words, some, yes, may make it to heaven, but it will be like they've escaped for their lives out of a burning house. And then, when King Jesus returns, he will also deal once and for all with all those who have opposed him, who have persecuted his followers, his disciples, and made life a living hell for them. And the sobering reality is an eternity of hell awaits them. The enemies of the gospel, wherever they are, will be eternally condemned. This is no feel-good parable, you understand. The implications are profound and eternal. So the question is, for you and me, which character in the parable are you? Are you one of the wise servants investing diligently Investing the gospel until Jesus returns, you're committed to that? Or are you a servant? I don't have interest in that. I'm not taking any action to do anything. What I've been given. And it's, it's possible. It's possible that some within the sound of my voice, either here or online today, I fit into that last category. God help you. That your only interest is listening to this message today is to figure out how you could somehow derail and undermine the work of God. Which character are you? Which character are you today? Let me pray for us. And we're just going to leave this in a, in a time of prayer as we close today. We're not going to sing another song. There's, there's nothing else coming here except a time of prayer. And you are welcome to stay as long as you would like to stay, need to stay. We've got some places here at the front if you'd like to come and pray. Perhaps there's something that has been revealed today that you need to confess and just spend some time alone with the Lord. We've prayed over some of the needs on the walls. I invite you to stay, pray over those. But I'm going to ask those of us who want to enter into conversation to take that to the lobby. Enjoy a cup of coffee and fellowship there. Let me pray for us. Fanny Crosby's formula for writing an enduring hymn was to pray first and ask Jesus to be her inspiration. So, Lord Jesus, would you be our inspiration today to invest faithfully, to invest creatively the treasure that you've given us until you return? Holy Spirit, would you convict those of us who claim to belong to you but so show so little evidence of any serious effort to invest in what you've given to us. Oh, convict us. Move in us. Cause us to get to a place like Zacchaeus found himself where we can do nothing but repent. Say, oh God, save me, a sinner. Oh, restore me, Lord. Lord, some of us have family members that fall into this category. Uh, they, they, they show no evidence of, a, of faith in you, a faith that they claim to have. They show no evidence of taking seriously their, 
responsibility to invest the gospel. It grieves us. It breaks our hearts, Lord, because their hearts are cold. They've walked away from your calling, it seems, in their lives. Lord, would you call, back, call them back? Would you call them back to yourself? Lord, you're, you're God who loves the prodigal, so bring the prodigals home, Lord. Bring them back to yourself, we pray. And then, Lord, as we think of our brothers and sisters serving faithfully in dangerous places, places that are nothing like here, where we enjoy immense freedoms, opportunities. I'm thinking of brothers and sisters this day worshiping in secret in, in Iran, in China, in Afghanistan, in other places where it can be dangerous to to be a witness for you in places like Pakistan and more who are risking far more than we can even imagine to invest what you've also entrusted to them. Oh Lord, we pray that you would multiply their efforts. <laughs> we pray that there would be a fruit, a harvest, a good seed from the good seed of the gospel planted in the hearts of those who've yet to come to know you. And Lord, we pray against those enemies of the gospel that would seek to undermine and destroy the work of your kingdom. We thank you, Lord, that there is coming a day when every person who has ever lived will stand before you to give an account. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are coming again. So would you sustain us? Would you motivate us? Would you move us? Because of the hope we have in Christ. And we pray these things in his name. We all said, Amen. So again, you are welcome to stay and pray. Pray over the requests on the wall. Spend some time with the Lord. God bless you. Have a wonderful week.